I've taken many adults on trips that have been bucket list trips. We just, we just got back. A group of our church went to Israel. And I hope that maybe you'll go to Israel with us, and I'll talk about the Israel trips a little bit in the message today. But, you know, one of the things I love about our trips to Israel, I love the first day. Not flying there. I don't love that. <laughs> no. You heard my story about that a few weeks ago. But I love the first day because almost everybody who goes to Israel for the very first time, I'm not exaggerating, almost everybody who goes to Israel for the very first time, this is their, this is their spirit the whole first day. We get, in a bu- we get in the bus after the first stop, and they're sitting there. Some people, tears are coming down, and they have their phone, and they're just scrolling through the 500 pictures they've already taken. And I, I'll walk back during the, during the bus ride almost every day, and I'll walk back down the aisle, and I'm asking people, hey, what'd you think? What'd you think? And we always get to the end of the first day. We're at dinner that night, and it, you're, you're walking a lot. There's a lot of maybe some, some, some things to complain about, but we get to the end of the first day, and without, with, without fail, just about everybody I've ever asked at dinner that night, we're, I'm going table to table, and I say, hey, what'd you think of today? Everybody goes, I, I, I don't know. It, it was amazing. Here's what I love to say to them. Well, this is just the beginning. Hey, we still have eight days of this. We still have seven and a half days of just seeing where Jesus walked and hearing. We just, and people always go, oh man, I can't wait. I can't wait. And I help them understand, like, listen, we're going to be walking a lot. There's going to be some things that uh, the bus ride sometimes can be a little frustrating. Listen, the airplane trip, I know those kids cried the whole way, but this is just the beginning. Buckle up because you are about to experience something amazing. Same thing with a kid trip, a trip with kids. Hey, kids, this is just, Dad, oh, man. And you look at the sights, and you tell them this is just the beginning. Disneyland, they're excited about the first two hours, and I say, man, we've got another 10 or 12 hours here. It is just the beginning. When we come to Exodus chapter number 13, we're coming to a place that you and I, we look back at, and we know about the years of wandering. You and I, we look back, and we know Right around the corner from this, next week, we're going to watch the children of Israel miraculously cross the Red Sea on dry land, and we're going to see all of the amazing things over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks. We're going to talk about uh, their shoes not wearing out and food being provided and watching fire uh, come down from heaven, just watching food be provided from heaven, all of this amazing things. But the children of Israel, they don't know any of that's in store. And we're going to be at a place today in Exodus 13 where I think the children of Israel, uh, if Moses and if God were to, if God were to set, down, sit down with them, he would say, hey, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of some incredible things that are in store for you. And so today we're going to look at, at Israel, the Hebrew people, as to what was their beginning. And then we're going to make a comparison to us and understand that, that salvation for the Christian. This is the point we're going to get at. When you receive Christ as your Savior, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning of an incredible journey. We need to, in order to help us be on the same page, we need to remember a few things. Children of Israel have been in bondage. They haven't had their own land for 430 years. Well, now they're finally free. Now they're finally free. Remember, they prayed and God met with them and the Lord came down and said to Moses, I'm going to use you to release, to set my people free, but it's not going to be without challenge. And so Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, the the, uh, king of Egypt, multiple times until finally God said, one last judgment, one last judgment, the judgment that we looked at last week, the, the death angel or the Passover. And remember, God told the people last week, hey, listen, If you you believe me, then you need to take an innocent lamb, have it dwell with you for four days. After those four days, you're going to kill that lamb in the sight of the people. And then you're going to take the blood of that innocent lamb and you're going to put it on your doorposts and the headposts of the door. And if I see the blood, I will pass over 
your house. There will be salvation, deliverance, freedom offered to your house if you'll follow me in faith. If you will, if you will believe this and make a decision based upon faith that this is going to happen. If you have faith in me, God said, and you put that blood up there, you kill that innocent lamb, I'll pass over you. And last week, we saw the incredible comparison. Really, many of you know this if you study the Bible. There's a lot of places in Scripture where there are pictures. They're called types or typology is the study of pictures or study of the uh, uh, similar stories in the Bible that all point to Jesus. The Passover lamb is one of the absolute best types or pictures. Well, why? Why? Because Jesus was the innocent lamb, and he died for the sins of the world, and that sin includes your sin. He died for your sin. The Bible says that he became sin who knew no sin, that we, those who believe, might be made the righteousness of God in him. And it's not, it's not that we receive his righteousness because we go to church or because we get baptized or because we follow some uh, religious leader. None of those things, none of those things can give me freedom or deliverance from the judgment of sin. The only deliverance that comes is when a person by faith trusts in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is free. It is offered to all. We have some in here today that made that decision last week. Last week made the decision, I'm going to put my faith and trust in Jesus and in him alone. Man, what a great decision. But how, did we, how is that made possible to us? Because of the death of the innocent lamb. Jesus died in my place. He died in your place. Matter of fact, I want you to say it with me. I want you to say, Jesus died in my place. Ready, go. Hey, he died for you. And when you by faith receive him, judgment is no longer yours. Hell is not where you'll spend eternity. Because you took a step of faith, freedom is now in your life. Because you took a step of faith, forgiveness is now offered to you completely. Because you now took a step of faith and you received Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you are eternally secure. You can't ever lose salvation. Isn't that awesome? Man, Jesus is never going to go back on his word. So the Passover lamb is an incredible picture. But here's what we're going to look at today. When you receive Jesus Christ, when they killed that Passover lamb, it was just the beginning. Just the beginning of an incredible journey. And when you receive Christ in your life, it is just the beginning of an incredible journey. Some things are going to happen. What's going to happen? We're going to see a few of those today. Exodus chapter number 13, let's stand together. Exodus chapter 13, Exodus chapter 13, already saying amen in church, I like it. (laughs) Three verses to start, or six verses to start today, Uh, three at the beginning, three at the end. Exodus chapter 13, verse number one, it says this, And the Lord, he spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth a womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out, of, out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place, and there shall be no uh, leavened bread eaten. Now skip all the way down to verse number 20. Verse number 20. They took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of of cloud to lead them in the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. I know those two passages, maybe we would look at them and think, well, how do those go together? It's just simply the beginning of their journey. Right as they start, God gives Moses a couple of thoughts that we're going to look at. Give me the firstborn, and then he sets in place the feast of unleavened bread or the celebration of unleavened bread. And then we see in verse 20, 21, and 22 that from that day forward, God was going to lead the people. From that day forward, God was going to lead the people. The children of Israel, they're at a crossroads. They've made a decision to follow him by faith, and now they have a choice. Do we continue following him by faith, or do we we rely on our own wisdom? Do we trust that he's got more in store for us, 
Or do we get discouraged and think we made a mistake when we left Egypt? And when you trusted Christ as Savior, you too are brought to the same crossroads, that you trust him for salvation. Can I trust him every day? Or am I going to regret the decision? But the principle, the thought we want to look at this morning is just this. Trusting Jesus at salvation, it's just the beginning of an incredible journey. Lord, I pray that you'd help us today. I pray that you would bless as we look into your word. God, I pray that you would just work in each of our lives, help us to see that salvation in you is just the beginning. I pray for those that, Lord, may be in here that have never put their faith and trust in you. I pray that today would be the day that they choose that. For those that have trusted in you, but perhaps uh, look at the journey kind of as arduous, and look at it and think, uh, man, what is going on? I pray that today would be the day that we are reminded that salvation is just the beginning of incredible things that you want to do in and through us. And so, Lord, I pray for every single person in here. I don't want to pretend like I know the needs of the hearts, but you do. And so, God, I pray that you'd speak to us in a very personal and special way. We love you, and we thank you for your love, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You go ahead and be seated. There's a few things in store for us on the journey of being a Christian. Knowing that it's just the beginning, here's some things, here's some thoughts that are going to continually or constantly be coming up in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ. They are reminders that we find in Exodus 13, knowing the comparison of Jesus and salvation with the children of Israel and their journey beginning. There's some things that we need to remember, hey, these are always going to keep coming up. Well, what are they? First, we need to know this, that in your journey and your Christian life, you are constantly going to be reminded And it's a good thing that you are saved by his strength. Hey, you are saved by his strength. I want you to notice in the passage, as we come to Exodus chapter number 13 and the story of the Hebrew people, God told them, we just saw it at the beginning, we even talked about it last week, here's what God told the people, I want you to constantly, every year, I want, remember last week we saw this, God said, this is going to be the start of your calendar year. Every year is going to be based off of this day. God said that to these people. God told them, I want you to put in, to install the, the feast of unleavened bread. I want you to install the celebration of unleavened bread. And then here's why I want you to do it. Because I want you to teach it to generations to come. Here's what God was doing. God was setting up before the people this, this thought. I want you to always remember what I have done for you. I want you to always remember what I've done for you. Here's how we see that specifically in our verse, in our passage. Go to Exodus 13 and verse number four. It says this, this came, this day came ye, of course, Moses speaking to the people. This day came ye out of the, in the month Abib or April. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. You shall set aside, what's the service? Set aside these days. Well, he continues, seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread. And in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done. We celebrate the feast of unleavened bread because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, Uh, And for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. What is God doing? Well, God is setting up some ways for the people to be reminded, I saved you. It was by my strength that I saved you. 
We're not going to really um, dissect the, uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but here's what we need to know about it. It was a celebration and still is a celebration that is set up uh, beginning the day of Passover for seven days. It begins with celebration and it ends with celebration. No leaven. Leaven represents sin. Leaven represents the old life. And so God said to the children of Israel, I don't want you to have leaven. I don't want you to be uh, uh, um, filled with the old life or be thinking about the sin of the world. I want you for seven days, I want you to constantly be reminded you are saved by my strength. Here's how God tells them in this passage. We won't go to all the verses, but chapter 13, verse number 3, he says, For by strength of the hand of the Lord, you were brought out from this place. Verse 8, this is done because of that which the Lord did. Verse 9, with a strong hand, the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Verse 14, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Verse 16, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. I think if you were to go through and read just Exodus chapter 13, you would find the Lord time and time again saying, hey, you need to remember that I did this. You need to remember that I saved you. You need to remember that it is by my strength. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it was a yearly celebration set to remember what God had done for his people. God had said to them, celebrate this day. Mark this day. Remember this day that I brought you out. You know, when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, for those of you that have made that decision... In your journey in the Christian life, there are going to be times in your life, whether it's through preaching or a song that you hear, there's going to be times in your life, maybe through the Word of God or through the, uh, the, just a conversation with somebody at work or at church or something like that, there's going to be constant reminders of this simple principle. You didn't save you. You didn't save you. you. You are saved by the strength of God. Paul said it this way, writing to Titus, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us. Hey, on the Christian journey, we may not have a feast of unleavened breads, but we should have times that we constantly come back to the thought that I am not saved by my, my goodness, and I am not saved because I brought anything to the table. No, 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 no. It's by His mercy. You are saved by the strong hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is offered, not because you and I deserve it. We don't deserve it. And yet forgiveness is still offered. Mercy is still poured out. On the Christian journey, I think it would be good for us to have a feast of unleavened breads almost. Wait, pastor, are we going back to the Hebrew root stuff? No. No, I think every day. Every day there should be a constant reminder when I get in the word of God, when I bow my head before him, when I pray that there's humility in my heart that says, God, I just want to remember, I want to be reminded constantly that you saved me. You see, when we have a constant reminder that he saved us, when we have a constant reminder that we are saved by his strength, hey, we can, just like the children of Israel, we can live a life of celebration. God said, hey, here's what I want you to do with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I want you to start celebrating what I did. I want you to go seven days without leaven in the camp. Don't have it even be around. And I want you to end celebrating what I did. Hey, it is a celebration if you know Christ as your Savior. I've said it before. I've quoted the great theologian, Judy Fountain. <laughs> when she says there's a lot of Christians that go around looking like they've been sucking on a lemon. Remember, all growing up, mom would say, well, just don't go around looking like you've been sucking on a lemon. Well, what do you mean? There's a lot of Christians that it's this all the time. Well, pastor, it's just the way my face is built. (laughs) We're not going to talk about that. There's a lot of Christians that go through life and and we're we're almost uh, Winnie the Pooh. How many remember Winnie the Pooh? We have a lot of Eeyore Christians. You know what I'm talking about, Eeyore? You know, when he says, how you doing? He says, another blustery day. <laughs> well, Eeyore, oh, Winnie, another blustery day.
blustery day. All the time. And they're trying to, they're trying, did you like that, Craig? You like, yeah. <clears throat> to ask me later, I'll do piglet for you. <laughs> Never mind. I was totally going to, uh, I just wish you could be in my brain one day and just be like, what is going on in there? Squirrels everywhere. We need to remember, what am I even talking about? Eeyore, lemon, Christians. You know, in, in, Christ, in Christianity, there are a lot of Christians, they're just, they're just Eeyores. Everything's bad. Everything's negative. And, if, and I was listening to a friend of mine preach this morning back on the East Coast, and he said there's so many Christians in life that just get their focus so much on our circumstances that we allow discouragement to set in, and we take our eyes off of the fact that we're saved. You're not going to hell. You can celebrate It means every day is a celebration. Why? Because your worst day, listen, your worst day on earth is literally going to be the worst day of your life. It just gets better. But for those who don't know Christ, their best day on earth is the best it's ever going to get. Hey, you're a Christian. Constantly be reminded, I'm saved by His strength. With that comes assurance With that comes conviction. With that comes challenge. There is so much in there when we allow ourselves to remember, I was lost. I was shackled to sin. I was absent and away from God and destined for hell. But God stepped in and said, no, I will die upon a cross. And if you, by faith, will apply the blood that I shed to your life, judgment, deliverance, it will all pass over you and you will be delivered. You will have freedom for all of eternity, freedom for every day. You will see things like nobody else sees them. Why? Because you are saved by his hand. Hey, children of Israel, celebrate celebrate it. Set up the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Why? Because I want you to come back to this point every year and remember you're saved by my strong hand. In the Christian life, we're going to continually be called back, be uh, reminded, continually come back to the thought that we are saved by him. But also today, we need to know this. That in our Christian journey, we will continually be called to surrender. Hey, every day of your Christian journey, you are going to be called to surrender. What is that? To submit to God and say, all right, God, not my will, but thine be done. Go with me to verse number two. We read it a minute ago where the Lord said these words, sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, It is mine. This thought of sanctify or giving the firstborn to God is throughout the entire passage. We're not going to read all of it, but you can go home and I would encourage you to read Exodus 13 today and you will see it built into the entire passage, the idea of setting aside the the firstborn for God. Now, here's my question. Why does God ask for the firstborn. I want you to think about it. I want you to answer out loud. I just want you to think about it. What would the reasoning be, excuse me, as to why God would ask for the firstborn? Well, here's a few. The firstborn symbolized the salvation of Israel. Well, how so? Because when the blood was applied, who would have died had the blood not been applied? The firstborn. So here's God saying to them, I want you to set aside or give the firstborn to me. This is not a sacrifice in the sense of kill your firstborn and give that. That's not what the Lord is saying. No, I want you to set apart the firstborn. I want you to know the firstborn belongs to me because I passed over. So every time you look at your firstborn child, Every time, Israel, you look at that firstborn lamb or that firstborn animal, every time you look at the firstborn, you need to remember what I did. The firstborn symbolized symbolized the salvation. But also, we need to know this, that throughout Israel's history, the firstborn was also considered the best. Now, this is where the older siblings go, ha, ha, ha. But it doesn't necessarily mean first in chronological order. In the Bible, there are times later in Scripture, God actually calls David the firstborn of his family. But David was the lastborn. 
So why does God say David was the firstborn? Well, it's because in that family, David was seen as the best. So firstborn doesn't necessarily mean chronological, although in this passage it does. But throughout Scripture, there are times when the Lord refers to the firstborn, and he's referring to the best. So there's another great reason as to why God is calling the firstborn. The reason is, we can see it even in Colossians 1, the firstborn, it means a place of eminence or a place of importance. So why is he calling the firstborn? Well, the call of the firstborn is simply a call to surrender. It is a call to say, every time you look at your firstborn animal, firstborn child, remember that you belong to me. Every time you look at that which is best in your life, every time you look at the blessings in your life, you need to remember, I did that. It's a call to surrender. It's a call to come back and recognize who God is and what he has done in our life. Do you see, and I wish we could spend the time to make all of the connections, but if you've been with us in our series, have you seen how many times that God says, I want you to stop and pay attention to what I am doing. Get your focus off of your issues and off of your problems and put your, put your focus back upon me because then you will be able to celebrate. You will be able to have joy. You will be able to trust because you recall what I am and what I've done in your life. And this call of the firstborn is simply that, a call to surrender. You know, in your Christian life, <clears throat> in your Christian life, God is going to continually call you to surrender. I mean, can God rightfully call that which he saved? Yes. One man said it this way, he created us and saved us. Both of these qualify him to call for surrender. He saved you, but he also created you. I love the old story of the little boy that he got a little toy boat that he built in his basement. He built in his basement this little model boat, and he was so excited about this model boat. Finally, he was able to go out and put it out on the little stream down by their house, and he went out and put it on the little stream, but that, unfortunately for that little boy, a gust of wind came up and just blew that boat down the stream, and that little boy couldn't keep up with it. He couldn't keep up with it. And that boat got away from him, and he went home heartbroken. And there he was going home heartbroken, and his mom and dad said, well, that's all right. We can, we can try to get you another one. He said, no, but you don't understand. I created that one. I put that one together. And that little boy, the next day, he was in town walking down Main Street, and he looked into one of the windows, and he saw at a used toy shop a little boat that looked just like his. And he went in and he looked at that little boat and he picked it up and looked underneath and sure enough, there were his initials. And the store owner walked up to that little boy and said, son, you like that boat? He said, yes, sir, I, I made this boat. And that, that store owner said, well, I'm sorry, son, that, that, that boat actually is for sale. Well, how much, mister? Well, son, that boat's going to be $20. And that little boy, he went home and for the next few weeks, he did all the chores he could he saved up $20. He went back to that store owner and he said, hey, mister, I want to buy my boat. And he put the money down and he walked out with his boat. And as he's walking out with that boat, he said, I made you and now I bought you. You're twice mine. Hey, in your life, Jesus Christ made you and he paid his life to buy you. You're twice his. So a call to surrender, it makes sense. In Scripture, the Bible actually says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20, you're bought with a price. Therefore, because of this, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hey, surrender to Him. 
What do we surrender? Well, we surrender everything. We surrender our first. We surrender our best. And the, the simple thought is this, that when we give our first and when we give our best to God, we are saying, God, I acknowledge that it all belongs to you and I trust you with everything. And so every, every day in your Christian life, as you move forward, we have to understand God gave his firstborn so I can give my first to him. God gave his best so I could be saved. And so that means I can give my best back to him. And so I give him my my morning and I give him my afternoon and I give him uh, freely of maybe my finances and I give him freely of my time and service and I, I have no problem giving the Lord glory by speaking his name. I, I have no problem by giving God worship, by telling others about him. Listen, it's just me recognizing God, you created me and you bought me surrender. It's just kind of like, well, duh. It's me coming back to the place where I just recognize in my Christian journey that as I follow God, there's going to be continual calls to surrender. In the, people of he, in the Hebrew people's life, this was God. Hey, for generations to come, give me your firstborn. For generations to come, give me your best. Well, why, God? Because I created you and I saved you, and I'm just calling you to follow me. Hey, lay down your life and follow me. But we must also know today that in the Christian life, it's just the beginning in the fact that his salvation should impact our everyday living. Your salvation, the salvation that Jesus Christ gave to you, God wants it literally to constantly impact every decision you make. Where do we see this? <clears throat> Go to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. We read these verses a minute ago. These are written, And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt." We read here that God wanted his people to constantly be impacted by what he has done. God wants the Hebrew people here, he, he said, I want it to be something that you tell your children and that it is on your forehead, on your mind, affecting your hands and in your mouth. Now, unfortunately, the Hebrews... They became literalists in this passage. I have a great burden for the Hebrew people. As a matter of fact, and are we live streaming today or no, Brian? Okay, I'm going to say this then. Uh, you pray, you pray. There's a couple tour guides that we use in Israel every year. And uh, one of them I've grown a very good friendship with. And I'm just, those of you that were with on to our tour, you know him, Joseph. Joseph is a Hebrew that he doesn't know Christ, yet he believes that Jesus rose from the dead. And we've had great conversation. You know what Hebrews, a lot of the Hebrew people have done is they've turned this into tradition by using what are called phylacteries. If you go to Israel, you will see commonly things like this. Walking down the street, sitting, studying. Do you see the strap with the box attached to this Jewish man's head? Do you see the band around his arm all the way down to his wrist? And then you can look and kind of see a box on the tips of his fingers, the knuckles of his fingers. Do you see that? Those are phylacteries. Well, what is that? Well, inside of those boxes are really tiny scrolls, either of Jewish laws that have been passed down or of the Torah, the scripture, the first five books of the Bible. So they took this and they said, all right, God said he wants it to be upon our heads and upon our hands. So we're going to strap God's word to our head and to our hand. But many of the Hebrew people, they've missed the principle. Was God saying, I want you to literally tie it to your head? I want you to tie it to your hand? No. 
No, here's what God was saying with this. As a matter of fact, if they, if they really processed and thought about this, and even there are even Christians still to this day that try to practice some of these things and miss it completely. Because in verse number 9, God also said, I, I want it in your mouth. So on your head and on your hand was the literal, but in your mouth, what's that mean? I don't see any of them walking around with a box in their mouth. Here's what God was saying. Are you listening? Here's what God was saying. I want it to be on your mind, on your head, as frontlets between your eyes. I want it to affect the directions you go. That on your hands, I want it to be that which impacts the actions that your hands take. In your mouth, I want what I have done to affect how you speak. And literally, this is what God is saying in the passage. I want you to constantly be thinking and affected by and impacted by my salvation in your life. So for the Christian, here's what we need to know. When you trusted Christ as Savior, God desires that that would be just the beginning, and he desires for his work, what he has done, his salvation, to literally impact every area of your life. God wants that. God wants you to wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, Monday, November 14th. He wants you to wake up and go, man, I'm saved. Man, I'm, I'm on my way to heaven. I don't have to pay for my sin. God, help me to think about you today. And then tomorrow at lunch, when you're at work and you're talking to your coworkers and they ask you about your weekend, God wants you to be able to say, oh, you know what? I went to church. Message was okay. Meh. But man, I got to spend time with other believers. Why do you do that? Because God's done so much for me. And God wants tomorrow when you get home from work and your kids are kind of pushing that frustrating button and maybe your spouse didn't, didn't do what she or he should have done and uh, maybe what you were expected, God wants his salvation to be on your mind in that moment so that it will impact your reaction to your family, how you respond to your coworkers. God literally desires that his salvation would bleed over l- into every single area of life. When you started salvation, when you got saved, salvation is just the beginning. God wants it to impact everything. It's him saying what is in your mind and heart ought to show up in your words and your actions. Hey, let my word be on your mind. Let it be your focus and let it show up in your life. But lastly today, we need to know this, that salvation is just the beginning to an incredible journey of being led by his spirit. Hey, you know what God wants to do? God wants salvation. One man said it this way. Salvation is the miracle of a moment. And discipleship or following Christ is the process of a lifetime. You know what God desires? He desires not to just save you. He desires to lead you every day. Not only to impact your decisions, but he desires to lead where you go. And here's, what, here's the thought. Sometimes God leads places that we were like, what? That doesn't make sense to me. Did you know sometimes God leads in directions that humanly just don't make sense? We see it in the passage, verse 17 and 18. Do you see it when it says that it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. That word harnessed, it means equipped or they were given a bunch of stuff from the Egyptians. And we talked about that last week. But here's what happened. I meant to have a map, so I'm just going to kind of have to be up here and you'll have to... Just kind of follow me, okay? So if you're looking at me, Egypt is right here, all right? Egypt, I'm going to have to do this backwards. Okay, Egypt is, oh my goodness. Egypt is right here, all right? Egypt's right here. Where is Israel in comparison to Egypt if Egypt's right here? It's up here, okay? Where is the wilderness of the Red Sea? If you know their history, the wilderness of the Red Sea is actually right here. Where's the land of the Philistines? Right here. So here's what God did. The Bible says that the land of the Philistines was near. They should, I mean, where's God going to take them eventually? To the promised land. 
Now they know that. Okay? Now you'll, oh, the, my map was in there. <laughs> Dustin, you are awesome. I just put it in the wrong spot. Okay, now we can look at this. If you look, the, the, the land of Egypt, okay, so the land of Egypt that the children of Israel were in was actually up in here. This whole area is Egypt. When it says Sinai Peninsula right there, that is the wilderness of the Red Sea. They're going to Israel. They knew God had promised that I'm going to take you back to your land. So if we're thinking, I mean, the shortest, the shortest route between A and B right here, it should be this. Whoop, right? But God says, I'm not going to lead them that way. No, actually, I'm going to take them down into the wilderness of the Red Sea. And they come down in the wilderness of the Red Sea. They cross the Red Sea down in this area down here. And when you look at it, the direction that God took them, it didn't make a lot of sense. Now, I want you to remember that, okay? Now, go to verse, 20, or verse 21 and 22. Go to verse 21 and 22. It says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and to lead them in the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So now God is actually giving them and God will do this for the next 38 years of wandering and then two years coming into the promised land and conquering. So for the next 40 years, here's what God does. God sets up a pillar of a cloud by day to lead them and a pillar of fire by night. What is he doing? He is giving an unmistakable way of his leading. It's unmistakable. If the pillar moves, you move. If the pillar stays, you stay. <clears throat> this pillar of cloud, it shows us a lot about the leadership of the Lord. Here's just some simple things. His leadership is constant. Pillar by day, pillar by night. You know how many hours are in day and night put together? 24, and then it all starts over again. I'm going to lead you constantly. It talks about his leadership being that of protection. The psalmist actually said that the cloud provided shade by night or shade by day. If you've ever been to Israel during some of the hottest times, or especially the Sinai Peninsula, the, the area that we saw just a minute ago, it gets very hot in the day and very cool at night. Well, if you have a cloud by day, it's providing some shade. And if you have a fire by night, it's producing, producing some warmth. It's God's, God's uh, provision. It's God's security. His leadership is constant. His leadership is that of protection. His leadership is that of provision. But his leadership is that which needs to be followed. You know, in the Christian life, when you got saved, just as the children of Israel maybe had to go a direction that they didn't want to go, you know, sometimes life takes us directions that we don't want to go. Sometimes circumstances come up in our family, and I'm thinking right now, and I won't talk about it much, but yesterday is my dad's birthday. He would have been 73 yesterday. And again, I'm not, this, is, this is not to compare my story to yours. or any, We all have these stories. I'm not going to try to make my mom cry. Mom, I'm going to try to not to make you cry, although I'm probably going to. So just plug your ears or turn your hearing aids off for a little bit, Okay. <laughs> You know, never mind. You know, in the, in the Christian life, um, you know, my dad passing away last year, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, humanly speaking, it didn't make sense. Why? Man, here's a man serving the Lord for 50 years, given his life. Many of you, there are many people in here that you are part of our church because of my dad's impact in your life. Our recycled teenagers, um, when dad first came here, he said in 2016, he said, Dennis, I'll do anything for you in the church, but I do not want to teach the old people's class. <laughs> My dad said that. True story, didn't he? And he was adamant. And at the time, we had um, a man that was teaching the class that was in the military, National Guard, and he got shipped out a few months after my dad was here. He was going to be gone for about six weeks. And so I just said, hey, Dad, 
I said, listen, I know you don't want to teach the old people class. I was like, but would you, I said, even though you are old people. <laughs> I said, would you, would you teach the recycled teens just, just for a couple weeks? No, Jim, he said this, I will, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, do not, do not ask me to take that class over. I said, okay, yes, sir, I won't ask you. He taught one week, and he said, huh, you know, we have some really good recycled teenagers at our church. <laughs> I said, I know, Dad. He's like, yeah, that was kind of fun. The second week, he was like, hey, listen, I'm teaching this class for six weeks. You care if I plan an activity? I'm like, an activity? He's like, yeah, we're going to get together. We're going to do something. I was like, like what? He's like, I don't know. We'll go bowling. or Maybe we'll go to Coeur d'Alene. Maybe we'll go to Cracker Barrel. Maybe we'll... And he started coming up with all these ideas. And I was like, well, whatever, Dad. Third week. He's like, hey, listen, so I'm thinking, in about six months from now, do you care if... And I'm like, you were teaching the class for six weeks. He goes, yeah, I know. But listen, here's... You know what? I love it. He said, I love teaching. I love teaching that group. They just soak it up like a sponge. They're not like you young people that think you know everything. <laughs> and dad, from 2016, fall of 2016, if those of you that were here, our recycled teen class, we still had Sunday school. Uh, growth groups were on Sunday mornings at 9.30 or, or something like that. He took that class from 10 people in one year, 10 people to 30 constantly in class. And for four and a half years, that class ran over 30 people every week. You know, when my dad passed away, I was like, man, God, this does not make sense to me. You know what God was saying? Hey, I'm not going to take you the way you think. Things are going to go a little differently. You know what Dennis has to choose? Okay, God, I choose to follow. In your life, sometimes things don't go the way you plan but we still have to choose to follow. And so what did God do? He led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the people, they just had to choose to follow. And here's the fact that God is now guiding them in unmistakable ways. Now God's presence is leading them. And here's what I want to say today before we close. In your life as a follower of God, the day you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, God's Holy Spirit moved into your life. And God wants to lead you through his word, and he wants to lead you through his spirit. Every day, God's still small voice uses his word to speak into you. So give God the first part of your day. Submit to him that part of the day. Surrender to him that part of the day to say, God, help me to follow you today. And from here on out, when you trusted Christ as Savior, it was just the beginning of a journey of decisions that you and I need to make every day to surrender and to choose to follow him. God desires to lead your life. Don't get so caught up in this world and in this culture's thinking and in everything going on that you miss the unmistakable leadership of Jesus Christ. Because you and I, like the children of Israel, they had to choose to follow that pillar. We choose to follow his spirit. And I love the quote I found this week on it. God does not lead his people in the nearest way, but he does lead us in the best way. I loved that. God does not lead his people in the nearest way. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Did you know that I never wanted to start a church? Did I? Hannah, when we got married, she's like, well, what do you want to do with your life? I was like, one thing I don't want to do is I do not want to start a church. <laughs> Literally, true. True. I'm in my master's year doing, doing a, my master's degree, and they assign subjects for you to write your thesis on, 10,000-word thesis. You know the, the assigned subject I got? Church planning. <laughs> I was literally like, I missed the day they picked subjects, and so I got assigned a subject, and they're like, well, Dennis's dad is a pastor, and his father-in-law's a pastor. I'm sure he'll want to be a pastor. And I came into class the next week, and they're like, hey, you were assigned church planting. And I was like, anybody want to trade? Because I'm never starting a church. They were like, well, you could start a church or a Christian school. I'm like, I'm not starting either. 
Like, let's, let, you know, talk about youth. That was my mindset. I'm just going to be a youth pastor or work in music or whatever. It didn't make sense to me when God put it in my heart in 2010 that we were going to be starting a church. You know what I did? No! God, I, I've told you I didn't want to do that. But you know what I look at now? I look back over almost 12 years of pastoring, 16 and a half years in ministry. I look back to that master's degree thesis paper. Seriously, I look at it and I look at God saying, I know this doesn't make sense to you now, but one day. You know what I'm thankful for now? I'm thankful we started a church. I am. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. <laughs> I believe, I believe that this, this is what God created me for. When your life meets your purpose. Hey, but you know what? I didn't, we didn't get here the way we thought we would. And from here on out, our church has some big steps ahead. And we're not going to get there the way that sometimes makes sense. But we just choose to follow God's leading. In your life, in your life, make a decision every day. I'm just going to follow God's leading. I'm going to give him the first fruit. I'm going to give him that which is best in my time. I'm going to give him time in the word of God. I'm going to surrender to him. Because we truly can be aware of, confident in, and thinking about the presence of God throughout every day. We can think about his leadership. We can, we can have our mind wrapped around. This is a 24-7. 24-7, God wants to be on my mind and impacting my decisions in my life. So the fact of the matter is this, that salvation, it's just the beginning. So here's where I want to end today. You can close your Bibles. We'll be done. <clears throat> I, just, I just want to end with a, two very, very basic thoughts, and that is this. If you know Christ as your Savior, how are you doing at surrendering and following? Are you surrendered? Are you surrendered to him leading your life? Are you following? Are you, are you seeking him? Are you pursuing God's path? Or are you pursuing your own? Is your will, is your plan surrendered to his plan? Or is your will surrendered to your plan? Is he leading? Is he guiding? Is he first? But maybe you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Can I tell you that he wants salvation to be your beginning? If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ is in your, in your life, Jesus wants you today to put your faith in him. It's a choice of faith. It's a choice of believing. And God says that's just the beginning.